Good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about gluten enzymes. Yes or no, for those of you who are interested in taking the enzyme, it's like a digestive enzyme, to break down gluten if you have gluten intolerance or celiac disease. So I'm going to discuss some of the literature on this as well as um, why gluten is bad. And here are the references I'm citing tonight. Again, I'm going to go through the article that I talked about last week. Uh, author Fasano is someone who you want to pay attention to. Title of the article is Celiac Disease, a Comprehensive Current Review. I'm also going to be talking about this article by Pultz. And it discusses the tolerability of TAC062, an engineered enzyme to treat celiac disease. So I'm going to talk about that and some other research on this subject. So let me hide my widgets, as they're termed. And let's get into the nitty gritty. Okay. So gluten is bad for a lot of individuals and there is a debate on how bad it is for everyone really, or just celiac disease patients. <clears throat> so the gliadin fragment, namely, if I remember correctly, the 33 mer fragment of the gliadin peptide is the most antigenic. It's important for us to know that gliadin Again, gliadin is the main antigenic peptide in gluten. Gluten is found in wheat, barley, oats, and rye. That this gliadin fragment is indigestible for most humans. And so this undigestible protein fragment can be very problematic for our intestines. Namely, we have these zipper-like proteins that bind each intestinal cell together called tight junctions, uh, more specifically referred to as zonulin and occludin. Uh, these zipper-like proteins keep each intestinal cell together and you want that because we wanna have a barrier integrity. In essence, from your mouth down to your rectum is, is a canal, it's a tube that's actually outside of our body from an anatomical standpoint. It's inside your body, but technically that tube is outside of our body. So we have this lining of our intestine that separates the outside from the inside and you want to have barrier integrity. You don't want to have, so to speak, a pipe in your house that has a bunch of holes in it. And so barrier integrity is very important, but gliadin can break down zonulin and occludin. More specifically, gliadin is a toxin for the zonulin protein. That was discovered in 2015 by Dr. Fasano and his group. That was a seminal article. It's a short-lived period of toxicity, so to speak, as long as gluten is there. But it illustrates the fact that everyone, whether you have celiac disease, whether one has uh, refractory celiac disease, gluten intolerance, or completely normal, the gliadin protein breaks down the proteins that keep each intestinal cell together. That creates what is referred to as leaky gut, bad term. I don't like the term. You can also call it increased intestinal permeability or intestinal hyperpermeability. And as a consequence, gliadin proteins or gliadin peptides and other molecules like bacterial components can be absorbed into the bloodstream right here at the, uh, at the digestive tract, creating a lot of inflammation. Now, gliadin is unique hopefully as you can see this diagram, in that it binds to, when we have this whole celiac disease process going on, we actually have a, an iron receptor, a transferrin receptor that goes from basically the bottom part of the enterocyte or intestinal cell and actually goes to the top. And when it does that, it then promotes almost like a, a quarterback handing off a football to a running back and the running back runs through the line with the football. So in essence, this transferrin receptor is brought to the surface in celiac disease patients, and then it brings in gluten, uh, protecting it from what's referred to as lysosomal degradation. And then the gliadin ends, excuse me, I should say gluten, the gliadin molecule, the gliadin molecule then comes into the bloodstream and it can really trigger the immune system. 
creating a host of downstream consequences, as you can see here, between innate and adaptive immunity, whereby then the immune system gets really turned on to make antibodies like tissue transglutaminase and gliadin antibodies and endomycelial antibodies. And all of these things can then lead to tissue destruction in the intestinal tract, namely of the small intestine as is seen on a biopsy. So that's what doctors are looking at. If we're testing you for gluten intolerance, we're looking at these antibody titers. We're looking to see how you feel after you eat gluten. We're looking to see what happens when they do an endoscopy and they remove a piece of small intestines. And we wanna see all these different facets of the disease to diagnose it as celiac disease. Now, I guess before I go into that, we can also say that a significant percentage of people have extra intestinal manifestations of gluten, uh, gluten intolerance. So outside of the 1% of the population that has celiac disease, a whole host of individuals have problems with gluten, which may range from feelings of depression, uh, low energy, dizziness, neuropathy, and it may be a very similar mechanism minus celiac disease. Now, on the topic of gluten enzymes, it would make sense that if you're on a gluten-free diet and you're still not feeling well, so let's say maybe your, your celiac disease is refractory or you're on a gluten-free diet, you're still not feeling right, you would question, well, maybe I'm experiencing cross-contamination. When I go out to eat, maybe they're cooking my chicken in the same fryer as, you know, uh, some sort of meat product or other product that's been battered with uh, wheat products. And so maybe that's why I'm not feeling well. So I'm gonna try these gluten enzymes. And some of them consist of latagglutinase, um, DPP4 is one of the more popular ones. And so you're gonna try these gluten enzymes. And basically the research is such that the early studies demonstrated a favorable response. Later studies showed that there was really no difference in the intestinal slides of individuals who are taking these enzymes versus those individuals with celiac disease who are not. Probably the explanation for this is that celiac disease is a complicated condition and it's not just one thing. Certainly gluten is the major trigger, but what they've seen is that there's poor stem cell function in the enterocytes of celiac disease patients. So one thing that we see with celiac disease on a microscope is that you have these little finger-like projections of your, of your enterocytes called intestinal villi. And we can see down here, this is referred to as the crypt, we can see hyperplasia of the crypt. So it's almost like this erodes, and then you have these nubs rather than nice long fingers which represent intestinal villi. And it's thought that this crypt hyperplasia that they continually see in individuals with refractory celiac disease can be due to poor stem cell function down in the intestinal crypts. So just because those taking gluten enzymes didn't necessarily have a change in their histology doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a bad thing for someone with a gluten intolerance or celiac disease to be looking at. And the second article that I, that I highlighted uh, basically was looking at that, it's looking at new types of um, gluten enzymes, TAC-067, I think is the name of it. It's probably gonna come out with a fancy name and be patented. But nonetheless, I place a lot of my patients, I, this is not medical advice that I'm giving to you, which may sound annoying, but I just have to say that. I'm not giving you medical advice for your condition, but I will say with my patients, lots of times I will use gluten enzymes when they have a severe case of gluten intolerance or they have celiac disease. So I'm gonna hide this one. If you have removed gluten and you're still having a lot of symptoms, other factors to, to look at um, would be microscopic colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I've read some studies that upwards of, I think it's 37% of refractory celiac disease patients, these are celiac patients who are off of gluten and they're still not feeling well, have this overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestines, lactose and fructose intolerances, diverticular disease, Crohn's disease, pancreatic insufficiency, drug-induced enteropathy. So in essence, one can have celiac disease, but they can also have many other, one or many other conditions complicating their clinical picture. 
So if you're off of gluten and you're not feeling well, these are topics maybe to discuss with your doctor. So uh, hopefully this is helpful. Uh, what I have found is that I use these gluten enzymes with my patients. Uh, there's a lot of research coming out on the microbiome and how certain bacteria may promote uh, the degradation of the gluten uh, peptide. And some of those bacteria seem to be soil-based bacteria. So root vegetables are a big source of discussion from uh, bacillus bacteria, bacillus subtilis, and other clostridia species. Clostridia is the uh, a group of bacteria that cause things like tetanus and botulism, things like that. Um, but there are other more innocuous forms of clostridia out there that seem to be helpful in breaking down gluten. Rothia species, if I remember correctly, there's just a whole host of bacteria that are being studied. So pay attention to that. As I see more research coming out, maybe I'll do a video on that. But that is the current information uh, that we have on the subject. So from a functional model, um, I don't think we need to show this one. So I think that pretty well summarizes it. So send me any questions that you have. Hopefully uh, you found this helpful and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful night and I will talk to you soon.